The bourbon secondary market. Well, it's not technically black market. It's definitely not white market. And it's probably more black than gray. So let's call it charcoal. The bourbon secondary market is a charcoal market. <laughs> Neat Nation, welcome to my show, The Nameless Whiskey Show with me, Droopy Whiskey. Just a little kickoff here tonight, what am I drinking? A little bottle that I've been working on for about a year and a half. This is one of the old, Old Scout single barrels. So, Old Scout uh, is a brand from Smooth Ambler out of West Virginia, and they got their start sourcing MGP whiskeys, MGP bourbons, and bottling them, and they did a really good job. And they really got hyped up on the secondary market and the value for their bottles kind of went through the roof. So I figured today, if we're talking about the secondary market, the, the Smooth Ambler Old Scout bourbon brand is probably a good one to drink whilst I do it. Almost done. We're, we're in bottle kill zone here coming up. It's a solid whiskey. Now if I did a side-by-side -side with this and one of the new Remus Repeal batches, batch three or four, I actually like... Remus repeal better, and it's worth a lot less on the secondary market. So, if you're a big MGP fan, go get yourself a Remus repeal reserve batch, either three or four, because those are lit. Okay, so the topic today is about bourbon prices and the secondary market. Like, what's the deal with the secondary market? Well, this is kind of a technical subject, but we're talking about it because a lot of people are getting into bourbon. I mean, lots. And I've actually had several people reach out to me and they're like, what does secondary mean? Like when people talk about people charging secondary prices, what are they even referencing? Over the past few years, we've started seeing price hikes in retail stores that are either coming from changes in the manufacturer's suggested retail price, or we're seeing retail establishments ignore manufacturer's suggested retail price and just charge whatever they want to for bourbon. So if you're a new consumer getting into this game, you might say, what is an appropriate price for a bourbon? And I get messages like that all the time saying, hey, I have the opportunity to buy this bottle at my local store. Is this a good price? So it's like a total crap show right now trying to figure out what a good price is. And that problem actually originated with the advent of the bourbon secondary market. So we're just going to do a little bit of review today on what is the bourbon secondary market. Like what, when people use the word secondary or secondary prices, what does all that come from? And then right after that, we're going to talk about why it matters and how it's impacted the bourbon world. So a little historical review. We all know now bourbon has exploded. American whiskey is taking off. It wasn't always the case. But back in 2010, we were certainly on the front edge of the ramp that's gone well, as high as the Tower of Babel, at least. <clears throat> and uh, people were wanting good bourbon. And there was a lot to go around. But that said, you still weren't always able to get the exact bottle you want. And as people got more and more into bourbon, they also got into bourbon collecting. They wanted to find the rarest, most cool bottles they could possibly find. Which is, you know, fun. That's what collectors do. But there wasn't a great way to do this. I mean, you could do auctions. Like a good source for bourbon auctions is actually a place called Skinner Auctions. You can just Google that. You can also look them up on Instagram. They're fun to follow because they handle a lot of alcohol-centric auctions here in the United States. They also do scotch and stuff. But um, that was a relatively small avenue and often you had to pay auction level prices to get rare bottles. But thanks to Facebook, we had an avenue that connected a lot of bourbon consumers together. The, the entire world by 2010 was pretty much on Facebook. They used it for connecting with friends and family, staying in touch. And because the entire world was on that platform and the groups feature was created, it started to become very, very easy to create networks of bourbon geeks, people who love to talk about this very, very lovely beverage and people who like to trade the very, very lovely beverage. Even some people who like to sell the very lovely beverage. So bourbon groups started to pop up in the early 2000 teens, 
and really got going heavy, heavy between 2013 and 2015. And with that growth of bourbon interest in bourbon groups came bourbon secondary groups. And these groups were people who had bottles and would sell them to each other, so a secondary sale, um, through Facebook. So somebody would post a product, hey, I have this product, it is for sale at this price, would you like to buy it? And then someone says, yes, I would like to buy it, and then they work out the details of payment and exchange amongst themselves. Now, to be clear, the secondary market is illegal. Um, it's always been illegal, was illegal. And there's really no other way of describing that. Like The operation operated and even continues to operate sort of uh, above the law or outside of the law. Although there have been people who, who kind of get nailed trying to sell alcohol secondarily. So law is you need a license to sell alcohol. If you sell alcohol without the license, you can get a uh, little bit of jail time or a pretty hefty fine. And many people have gotten that pretty hefty fine if they get caught selling alcohol. That said, um, the amount of people who got caught relative to the amount of exchanges that happened, very, 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 very small. So this absolutely booming community of bourbon enthusiasts just developed their own market, really, for their products, for exchanging the products that they loved and were passionate about. Um, and that became known as the bourbon secondary market and existed primarily on Facebook for a long time. Over time, we've started to see some more avenues developed um, to allow for the secondary sale of bourbon. So if you buy it and want to sell it to somebody else, there are people who are licensed brokers who will do that. A good example for that is Bottle Blue Book. Um, so they will purchase your bottles and then arrange the sale of your bottle pretty legally <laughs> and uh, help you find a bottle maybe that you would really, really like to have. But again, you're going to kind of pay through the nose for it because it's a little bit above board. Now, when these sales would happen, they're always at a premium. Like if you have something that somebody else can't get, you purchased it for a price, you want to make profit. You want a margin. So you would say, listen, I paid 100 I will give it up for 150 And somebody said, cool, I'll pay 150 Then 150 is the new market value. It is the secondary value of the particular whiskey. So over time, we saw things that people really, really liked that were harder to get, um, get bought up quickly out of stores because many people were aware of the secondary market on Facebook and other places and the secondary value of a product. So people began to buy bourbon and rye, American whiskey, specifically for the purpose of flipping it. And this started driving the values up a lot because then what was already scarce is now more scarce because people are buying it in a frenzy to then flip it on the secondary market. A good example of a whiskey that has been influenced by the secondary market would be Blanton's. So Blanton's, when I got into whiskey four years ago, I saw it on the shelf a few times and it was MSRP $50, wow, $50 a bottle. Now, the MSRP I think is $60, like the suggested retail price from Buffalo Trace, but you never, ever see it on the shelf for $60 because people wanted it. It was hardish to find. People bought it and stored it and uh, then sold it on the secondary markets for $80 or $90 to the point where this is almost impossible to find on the shelf anymore. And when you do, people aren't charging the standard retail price of $50 to $60 for it because they know they'll get bought out immediately by people who will buy it and flip it on the secondary market. So now we see the price of $100, $200, $300 for this bottle, this $60 bottle. It's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit crazy. Um, you know, in, in general, though, um, you know, the secondary value <coughs> of a Blanton's bottle, not a store pick, but a standard Blanton's bottle, rests about $100, is that people will buy it and sell it for about $100 on the secondary market. But if you're an unsuspecting consumer walking into a retail store, you've heard of the, the mythical legend that is Blanton's. Um, this mythical legend created by the scarcity, which was created by the secondary market, um, you may unsuspectingly pay well over 
MSRP and well over secondary value because the stores believe they can now get that. Make sense? It's a little crazy, a little tough to track. So if you're in bourbon groups on Facebook, you're, you're seeing people buy stuff on Instagram and they talk about, yeah, I walked into a liquor store and Joe Bob, the owner, you know, everything was priced at secondary value. You know, like they had a bottle of Weller 107 for 125 bucks. Uh, yeah, that's a thing that happens. <laughs> when you know that people camp outside your store to buy your product and then flip it. So you are, if you're a store owner, and this is an important point to note, as, as a store owner, why would you sell something at the MSRP if you know that somebody else is gonna buy it for double that? Like you know if you sell it to the dude who's camping outside your store, he's gonna go make the profit. Well, he's got a job, but your job is to sell bourbon. Like that's how you're trying to make your living. Of course you're not gonna do that. Like you're gonna try and get what you can for it because that's the true value of it. The true value of the product is what somebody will pay. So as much as we like to rant and rave about the, the thieving liquor stores charging secondary prices, like the problem, if there is a problem, is that the secondary market showed the true value of American whiskey in today's economic climate. Like the true value of American whiskey isn't what the MSRP is. Like otherwise we'd be able to find Blanton's and Elmer T. Lee and Parker's Heritage Products and Buffalo Trace Antique Collection and the Pappies, stuff like that. We'd be able to find it on the shelf if the true value of those products was what was listed on the price tag. Bottom line is it's not. We, we've made it clear in our buying and selling on the secondary market that the value is actually much, much higher. So eventually what will happen is what I think we've seen in Scotch. It's that the ultra premium products, the products that really carry with them a level of distinction and class, I mean, which of course we invent by marketing, um, those things cost a bajillion dollars. Like you go to Total Wine or Specs or something like that and you go look at their cases and you look at the Scotches and all the Scotches in the case are 300, 500, 1,000, multiple thousands of dollars. That's what high end, super rare scotch goes for high-end super rare bourbon and american whiskey was going for 50 80 100 dollars for decades until the last seven years only then has the market for these things really exploded and the msrps have not changed that much so a super rare ultra premium bourbon where it was previously priced maybe $60, today is priced at about $150, where it seems like, holy crap, that's a 300% increase. Well, yeah, but it's nothing compared to what the, the price and going rate is for a high-end scotch. And the rarity is often very, very equal. You have, you have a few thousand bottles of the super rare scotch, you have a few thousand bottles of the super rare bourbon. It would make sense if the price was comparable, I think. Now that doesn't say what's right or wrong. That just kind of is a, a market assessment. Like I'm, I'm a business person. <laughs> I sell coffee for a living. And I kind of like find it interesting to figure out, you know, why does the world work the way that it does in terms of dollar movement? And the way that the bourbon prices are going and the way, reason that people buy and flip is because they can. Like they, they see the value in the product and they know that they can make a little bit of money off of it. So somebody's gonna try and make money off of it. It's either gonna be the producer who's setting the MSRP and selling it you know, to the distributor who sells it to the store, who sells it to <laughs> the end consumer, or somebody else is gonna take that cut along the way. And it's either really gonna be the producer setting the price, the retail selling it to the end, cust end customer, or the end customer who's buying it and then flipping it for a profit. That's just the way that it works. So to recap, if you hear the word secondary prices, it means that a store is generally selling a product for what somebody who's trying to flip that product would sell it for. The secondary value of a product is what somebody who's flipping the product is selling it at. So if you're talking with somebody about trading a bottle, they may say, you know, I'll trade you this, but the value or secondary value of it is 150, even though they paid 80. So they're gonna ask you to trade something that has a similar secondary value. And there are really two ways you can find out what that secondary value of a bottle is. 
One is Facebook groups. There are still some Facebook groups that are operating as bourbon secondary markets. What was really interesting is last year, last summer, Facebook started to tighten up its groups. They were shutting down sales of all kinds of uh, questionable items, tobacco products, vaping products, firearms, and, and alcohol. There was a very, very large like national bourbon secondary market called the Bourbon Secondary Market that was shut down, I think, in lit, very late July or August, very early August of last year. Facebook just took it off. <laughs> but, I mean, people were moving all kinds of volume through that channel, so where there is money, uh, I'd say life finds a way from Jurassic Park, you know that, but money finds a way. Bourbon finds a way. And when money and bourbon are tied, things are going to get a little dicey. So there's still smaller, more localized bourbon secondary markets on Facebook. Um, and then people are figuring out other ways to connect and finagle and wheel and deal. So you can find one of those groups and join them. And uh, be careful if you do that because, again, it's still illegal. The other way you can look up the secondary value of a product is to go to Bottle Blue Book. So it's like BottleBlueBook.com, I think. Let me just check. Correct. They don't have everything on that site, but they have a lot of different bottles, a lot of rare bottles that you can look up and see what the sale price history is on them. Bottle Blue Book was gathering data from the bourbon secondary markets on Facebook to help track their valuation. They're not doing that as much anymore because the big one got shut down, but they still have good records of when products have sold, um, particularly through their site. So that's one way you can check the valuation. Other is to watch auctions. So Skinner Auction House I mentioned is one, but there are many others too across the states that you can just try and follow along their social media or look at records of their auctions and see what bottles are moving for. I'm sure given the power of the Googles, you can find out or get an idea of what your bottle may be worth. Now I do think as we wrap this up, the prices of bourbon and American whiskey, particularly the premium products, the products people really, really want, the overhyped products, it's going to continue to escalate until the market reaches a point of equilibrium. That is where supply meets demand. So your supply and your price level meets the demand and the amount people are willing to pay. That's just the way it's going to be. Like At some point, your price gets too high where people stop purchasing. And that we're just not there yet. Like the frenzy only gets worse the higher bourbon prices go. And that's actually a pretty good marketing tactic for a lot of people. Sometimes, and this is probably the case in bourbon, is that it was deemed as a cheap product. And if you want to get a nice something to sip, you don't want to buy a cheap product. So you'll buy scotch, which had a premium allure. Bourbon did not have a premium allure for a long time, has only just gotten that. And as their prices have escalated, so has the interest around the product. And until the prices escalate to the point that interest diminishes, it's going to continue to go up. So don't be surprised as you see prices continue to escalate. It's going to happen. Heard it here first. If you're ever shopping for bourbon and you find a bottle you want or you've heard good things about, and you don't know if the price is fair, be careful. Don't hesitate to throw a little quick text out to your, your pals, your buds, or send me an Instagram DM. I'll try and respond quickly of whether or not it's a good price. Like Bottom line is, don't get taken. You might get taken, so be careful if you're new to this game. Make sure you understand what the manufacturer suggested retail price is on a product, and then you have to decide for yourself how far you're willing to go above that, how much that product is worth to you. And then pay whatever it's worth to you. Like If you're buying at the store and it's going to you know somebody who's trying to make a living it's not bad to pay above msrp it's not thievery you know it just is what it is you pay what it's worth to you nobody's making you pay it and then if you don't want it at the price they're offering it for then don't buy it all right that is my little rundown of the bourbon secondary market and bourbon and american whiskey pricing as it is it is a very touchy subject so try to limit my hot takes my, my bottom line is be careful and uh, try and stay legal. Just always a wise call. 
If you like this video, just get down and smash the like button, like the video. Leave me any feedback you want to leave me. I would appreciate that. Constructive criticism is helpful. If you want to troll me, please don't. Go troll yourself or whatever. Uh, exciting news coming up later this week. I am starting a journey throughout 2021 to taste 100 different craft whiskeys. I, I know quite a bit about the major American whiskey distilleries across the states, particularly in Kentucky, but I'm really on a path to like broaden my palate exposure to the small distilleries out there across our country. So I'm stoked to get started on that and I'll release the first video going through whiskeys one through four later this week. We're doing 100 over the course of 2021. Thanks squad. Stay healthy, stay safe. Remember to keep it neat.